Hello, everyone. Welcome to my show, Looking to the East. I'm the host. My name is Steve Zerker. I'm a professor and dean at Kansai Gaidai University. Welcome to our last show of the year. So I guess I uh, wish you a happy holiday period and also a wonderful new year as we move into 2022. Uh, our show will continue again in January and uh, look forward to having more exciting uh, topics <clears throat> regarding Asia and Japan in particular. Today, we're very, very fortunate to have Alan Miner, who I think has been my number one guest over the duration of this show. Alan, there's uh, going to be a plaque or some kind of award <laughs> in the future for you. So well, I'll Alan see Miner, if I can earn it. Okay. <laughs> Alan uh, is a well-known venture capitalist in uh, Japan a long history of working in the technology industry in Japan. It started uh, with a degree from Brigham Young University, a mm -hmm. dual degree uh, in computer science and Asian studies. And I have to imagine, Alan, you were the only person at the school with a dual major of that sort at that time. Uh, I, I think that I probably was, yeah. Yeah. So with that, he ended up uh, working for Oracle, which is the number one database company in the world, a huge software success. Uh, leading to him becoming the country manager for Oracle Japan in the late 80s and going into the 90s. Uh, he continued to work uh, for Oracle in a variety of different positions, vice president positions and so forth. And uh, that went extremely well. Oracle Japan is a huge success. Um, so Alan eventually left Oracle and then decided to start uh, an incubator venture capital company in Shibuya back in the glory days. Uh, the Bit Valley days uh, in the early 2000s. And that's how we got involved in venture capital and startups, the startup world uh, in Japan, and not just Japan, but worldwide as well. So a long, long history of uh, technology and uh, investments and management and over what, I think you told me over 300 startups, potentially. Uh, yeah, between all involved. of my angel investments, friends, fool and family investments, uh, venture capital investments. Yeah, we're getting pretty close to 300 companies now, yeah. Yeah, but uh, the topic of this show is lifestyle medicine. And maybe some of you are not familiar with that term. It's certainly not something that's uh, popular or well-known in Japan. But Alan has pivoted, in a sense, away from his history of pure technology investments like Salesforce.com. He helped to bring them into Japan and is now focusing on this area, mm -hmm. lifestyle, uh, preventive medicine, uh, diet quality, and so forth. So that's what we want to talk about in the show. So again, Alan, thanks so much for participating. Yeah, Maybe we can start with your own. How did this happen? How did you... Uh, move from what you have been doing traditionally over the last few decades to looking at this new area mm -hmm. as an investment area, area focus? Well, I've, I've been a fan of Netflix documentaries for ages. And I, one of the ones that I remember being shocked and fascinated by a couple in the mid 2000s was Cowspiracy and King of Corn, kind of talking about how damaging uh, the American food supply chain is to the environment and to our health. And, and as new documentaries would come up in that space, I've, I've always been kind of intrigued by how the world works and by what people are saying or thinking about food and health. It's been kind of just a background curiosity of mine. Uh, when, when those documentaries come out, I've tended to watch them. But none of them changed my own personal behaviors. They all just was knowledge that I was accumulating and not leading to any particular personal or business action. About seven years ago, my mother had a near-fatal heart attack, switched from a normal American diet of uh, fast foods, steaks, chicken, uh, home, home cooking, outdoor, you know, eating at restaurants. Uh, and she had uh, asthma from childhood, was, had advanced ar uh, rheumatoid arthritis that made it difficult for her to get around except in an electric wheelchair for a number of years. Um, uh, had, was, had a very advanced type two diabetes was almost blind and on the verge of having to go on to dialysis for her diabetes, uh, had asthma from childhood, and then had this near-fatal heart attack uh, one morning about six, seven years ago. Not a good situation. 
yeah, as a consequence of that, she immediately switched to on the advice of her doctor. And uh, she says, you know, prayer in the bookstore to decide what book of all the hundreds of books on diet and health that are in the bookstore, which one she should read to uh, do what she could to improve her health. Uh, she stumbled on the starch solution by Dr. John McDougall, who actually developed his practice in Hawaii uh, on nice. a plantation. <laughs> Uh, and his 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 work and his practice as a cardiologist emerged out of the observation that the first generation Japanese working on the plantations were very healthy to their end of their lives. He never saw heart disease, very few cancers, almost no chronic disease among the first generation immigrants. The second generation was a little less healthy, and the third generation were most of his patients. He was seeing people in their 30s with diabetes, uh, extremely obese, and and looking into it, uh, he. He observed that the traditional Japanese diet, which is high in starch from rice, a little bit of fish, lots of vegetables and fruits, a lot of variety of foods, the, the only thing that he could observe that he observed in those generational differences was the, how the diet evolved over the generations living in America. And similar studies had shown an even more dramatic uh, increase of chronic diseases of those that emigrated to the mainland, settled in San Francisco and the West Coast. So there, are, there are a number of studies in the 50s and 60s that demonstrated that genetically they were very, very close, but as lifestyles changed, chronic diseases increased. That the healthiest Japanese were back in Japan, the second healthiest were in Hawaii, the least healthy were on the West Coast of the United States. Uh, and so he began, he, be, he began try, recommending diet changes and saw great results in his patients and ended up working in a cardiology hospital or the cardiology ward of, cardiology ward of a hospital in California and continued that research. Anyway, so my mother, my mother's journey began with reading that book and realizing it's important to get full, that the fruits and vegetables on their own don't usually make you full, uh, fats uh, can and starches can. And anyway, her, her journey began with that. By two years later, uh, her heart, her arteries had cleared up completely. She had two stents, but, uh, but then she no longer needed them, frankly, because her diet changes had cleared out her cardiovascular system. Her diabetes, uh, she, she's now almost 80, went to renew her driver's license, and they require for diabetes patients three monthly quarterly checkups to make sure that you're not going to have a fainting episode while driving. Uh, her doc doctor gave her a you don't need to come in for those checkups. So he, she now has a driver's license with no limits because her diabetes is completely gone. Her eyesight is completely uh, restored. Her, her eye uh, quality is good. Her, her asthma is down from six times needing to rely on the spray every day to once or maybe twice a month. And her body, her muscular movement is great. So she had experienced this. She's been telling me and my, my siblings to read these books, live this way. You know, for four or five years. So she now. became an they, evangelist of this. We say, we say, yeah, mom, mom, we're so we're so happy that you're healthy and living along <laughs> and getting out and enjoying life again. But uh, it's not for us. It's so, very typical response. <laughs> yeah. It's, so, I've I've read most of the books that she read or had have skimmed through them. I was aware of of the potential impacts, um, and I had seen I'd seen interviews in the documentaries over the years about this person or that person curing cancer by changing the diet or getting losing a lot of weight or other diabetes patients kept being able to go completely off of medicines they've been on for 20 years by a simple change of diet. So I was aware that this kind of effect happened to people, but somehow it didn't become personal for me until I was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma last November. Uh, hospitalized for it. And the, the first uh, in Japan, happily, we have a national health insurance system. So when you're going under treatment of chemotherapy, which can have very serious side effects as it uh, attacks predominantly cancer cells, but it can cause other damage in the body. In Japan, they keep you in the hospital for the first two weeks to so just watch how you're reacting to the drugs, make sure that everything is proceeding as planned with no undue side effects. Um, and so I had a lot of free time. You know, the doctor comes in once a day to check how you're progressing. And other than that, uh, you're pretty much on your own. And during the lockdown, they did not want to be going out of the room and going on walks in the neighborhood or around the hospital. So it was it was a very quiet two weeks. Um, the so first you were like day, in solitary confinement. Basically. Almost, yeah, yeah. It's like lockdown plus lockdown. <laughs> um, so uh, the first day I was there, my mom, who had, who had listened to talks on YouTube and read so many books of authorities in this 
diet health nexus said, Alan, you might really enjoy uh, what Dr. William Lee, L.I., has to say. He's a uh, Chinese American uh, pharmaceutical researcher, general practitioner, uh, and then the last uh, 25 years has been studying individual foods and their impact specifically on a, on a mechanism called angiogenesis, which is our body's ability to very rapidly create new capillaries at any injury site in the body. So when, when we are injured or cut ourselves or whatever, there is an intense amount of acti very rapid activity to deliver blood and blood platelets and or uh, immune, immune uh, effects to the site of the injury. And apparently when mutated cells are uh, aggressive enough to, to begin growing, they are able to trick the body. The, the body has all kinds of mechanisms to stop a mutated cell from developing into cancer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so mom, mom recommended that I watched, uh, that I look into William Lee. I found a TED talk online and his TED talk changed my perspective on not just my own health and, and gave an, a much deeper understanding of how, how often we all have potential cancer in our bodies 10,000 times today. There are all kinds of reasons why cells mutate, uh, aging being one of them, mm -hmm. uh, different chemicals that we encounter in the environment or consume all kinds of reasons why our cells might mutate, but the cells themselves have a mechanism for committing suicide. If, if it, in, when the DNA replicates, if it is messed up, uh, the double helix uh, system and other mechanisms in the cell prevent mutated cells from replicating in well over 99% of the cases. So we have potential cancer in our bodies 10,000 times a day, but <clears throat> it rarely F ever develops into actual aggressive cancer. And that process from mutation to uh, hospitalization can take seven mm -hmm. to 10 years in, in most cases. Uh, and anyway, so his work, his words of work was what, what does the body do when uh, cancer cells succeed in replicating, begin to grow, uh, that allows them to continue growing uh, ad infinitum until they become dangerous. Right. And the supply of blood and nutrients to the tumor site was, is a key mechanism that was uh, uh, clarified uh, and established in Harvard in the 70s when he was a student there. Mm -hmm. He spent uh, the first 20 or so years of his career uh, in pharma developing new angiogenesis inhibiting drugs. They successfully introduced four new treatments that cost about $100,000 a year to increase the effectiveness of chemotherapy and uh, hearing <laughs> cancer. And because he was also a practicing physician and getting the question that my mother asked her doctor, what can I do to improve it? What can I change in my diet? What can I do with my day-to-day -day life to reduce my, to increase my chance of curing, healing my cancer or healing my diabetes or healing my heart disease? Uh, dr. Lee got frustrated that he didn't have an answer for it. He said, I didn't learn anything about nutrition in college. I don't it just eat healthy. I don't, I don't know what to say. I've never been trained in this. And that began to be frustrating enough for him that in 1995, he shifted from pharmaceutical development to applying the same techniques of controlled placebo clinical studies, uh, uh, mouse studies, uh, to study what different foods might enhance angiogenesis capillary formation, what might inhibit it, and uh, is, there, is there a possibility that we can starve cancer? So the title of this talk was, Can We Starve Cancer? With a titillating title like that, the answer obviously is yes. But, and so I, un watching his TED talk, I, in 15 minutes, I learned a lot <laughs> about cancer that I had, was not aware of before. I learned for the first time that there are research in the United States using clinical trial quality studies on, on mice, on, on human patients to confirm that uh, diet, uh, bad diet choices are the root cause of most of our chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, uh, many, many cancers, about 86, around 70% of cancers have their roots in dietary choices, primarily animal proteins. Anyway, so there, there is a huge body of research uh, being done at the same or better quality than is applied to new pharmaceuticals. And this was an eye opener for me. And uh, there are hundreds of collaborators uh, with Dr. Lee's Angiogenesis Institute around the world at hospitals, universities all around the world. And I thought, I 
really want to meet the, the guys doing research with them in Japan and support their work and do what I can because I'd never heard of this before. Mm -hmm. It's exciting to understand that the choices you make, you don't have to wait till you're sick and go to a doctor to pop pills or get hospitalized. The choices you make can keep you out of the hospital. Uh, there's a good, good work on actually reversing and curing heart disease, which is my mom's experience, that you can be in the advanced stages of an illness and without dependence on drugs by making better dietary choices, getting a little bit of walking exercise in every day, you can actually heal yourself. Um, all of the practitioners in the space recommend doing it with a doctor to advise you uh, because sometimes our bodies react so quickly to the diet changes that we make that if we continue taking the same doses of the same drugs we have been taking in the past uh, oh, it can oh, cause serious side effects I uh, see. Uh, for example the reaction of diabetes patients to this change can take as little as a couple of weeks and the if you continue dosing insulin at the same level you were before you made a dietary change you can actually induce insulin poisoning and and get rushed to the emergency room so wow. they, they always recommend that making the change uh, with the advice of a doctor, but I, I, I looked, I could, I could find only, only two doctors out of hundreds in the world from Japan that were doing work with him in, in this country that was so worried about cancer. The two doctors were macular degeneration, the, the loss of eyesight connected with diabetes, but right. especially, so nobody in the cancer space, nobody in the heart disease space, I could find doing work with the doctors in the United States that were on the forefront of this. And so that there, that the, the fact that I had, I had, I, my mother, as a, as a very personal example of how someone's life can be impacted by this, mm -hmm. my own cancer and hospitalization and discovery of how advanced the science is in this space in the United States and how, how rapidly the emerging and a lot of the vegan movement in Japan, which kind of overlaps with this lifestyle medicine movement a lot. Mm -hmm. had been driven by things like the cowspiracy and corn king corn documentaries around animal ethics and environmental ethics drove a lot of it so a lot of the vegans in the world begin from a point of what we're doing to the animals is horrific we need to stop what we're doing to the environment is horrific we need to stop and take care of the planet take care of the other living species is it's a very it's an ethical issue for most of them i, I yeah. discovered that the potential impacts for health uh, are huge and and although Jap in Japan have traditionally have a very Japanese have a traditionally very healthy diet right but yeah that's one thing I wanted to ask you is yeah. that um, there is a perception uh, with my family in America that Japanese lifestyle is healthier and you read about it the is. longest lived people in the world and they're generally yep. Japanese yeah uh, but that doesn't mean I, for those of our viewers that are, are not living in Japan I mean those of us that are here we know uh, the diet in Japan is westernized significantly yeah. over the yeah. last 30 years. Yeah. And as Alan mentioned, the traditional diseases that are very prevalent in the West are now here in Japan as well. Diabetes, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. is yeah. growing significantly in yeah. this country, which yeah. is yeah. maybe surprising to some of the viewers. Alan, well, we're, I, I want to reserve time for your investment yeah. strategy, which is so yeah. fascinating. But just very briefly, obviously, you've recovered, thankfully, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. from your lymphoma. Yeah. And you work. Have taken what you have learned, what you just described, mm. and you're experimenting, I guess, with yourself, if you call it yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, why don't you brief, briefly talk about that? You, before we came on air, you mentioned that your Hawaiian Aloha shirts have gone from triple L down uh, to L and maybe even merging into M. So, yeah. tell us what yeah. you've done over, since uh, November last year. Uh, well, as I uh, I obviously I'm not persuaded by my mother's example or by my wife has been trying to get me to eat natto and do other things that she thinks uh, are healthy that's, that's, forever. That's a step too far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm not there yet. But um, for me uh, to take action, I want to have an understanding of the logic behind it. So um, the the research that I was reading, the uh, I've done a lot of a lot of the reading now that my mom has done over the last seven years and watched a lot of videos and the evidence for me is compelling, the the scientific underpinnings of links between diet and most of the Western chronic diseases uh, having their root cause. And of course, diabetes is caused by bad dietary choices and 
the the food industry would like to have you believe it's because we the kids are sitting at home playing Nintendo, not getting running around playing in the outside. But the calories we can, can we can use up through exercise versus the calories we consume. Uh, clearly, diabetes is a diet uh, centered problem, uh, and we've we've come because obesity is associated with so many of these cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and other things. We tend to think that obesity is the cause. Uh, uh, and they all have their root cause in diet. So um, as I was reading different books, uh, one of the things that I really liked about Dr. Lee's work is in his list of foods that promote the five bodies, health rep rep reparation and restoration systems, the microbiome in the gut, and geogenesis, the, the immune system, the ability of the cells to regulate their DNA and avoid DNA mutation, uh, and the stem cell system. There are different foods that strengthen each of those. And so Dr. Lee's approach for me was the right first step because he, he, he says, I'm not going to tell you what not to eat. Uh, he kind of, he talked, he sort of talks about eating a steak as equivalent to catching the flu. Your body's repair system is enormously powerful. And it's, oh it's as long as, as long as you're getting enough, uh, food that, that enhances and provides nutrition to the five repair systems, your body can recover from a number of diseases. And, he, and, and so I, I think he mentioned that. And so I like to tell my friends, uh, but why would you want to go out and catch the flu again just after you get over it? So, so, if, so Dr. Lee's approach, include, the other thing about his diet that maybe say, think this could actually work in Japan is fish and quite a variety, large variety of fish are included as health promoting foods in his, okay, his diet recommendations. <laughs> um, and so the fact that I was suffering from cancer and Dr. Lee had scientific research of clinical trial quality supporting more than just a hardcore vegan diet, which for me was going to be very difficult to adjust to that uh, approach uh, that fish run it and surprisingly chicken not breasts but chicken legs are have a positive impact on one of the five uh, body repair systems so chicken legs are on his list of things a glass of red wine for the polyphenol once a day one glass of wine per day or one or two beers per day so there's there's enough there's enough uh, familiar foods that says i i could i could follow this recommendation, I could do it. But as I've continued to study, I've become to believe that a more strict whole plant food diet is a healthier one than Dr. Lee's more flexible recommendation. And so uh, a little over a month ago, uh, a book by a medical doctor who's the son of the leading uh, nutrition researcher of the last half of the 20th century, T. Colin Campbell, his son, Thomas, had a book on diet and he recommended that if you were going to make this change that it's better to like talk, like if you're trying to stop tobacco you don't stop smoking by saying i'm going to only have two a day for the rest of my car i'm only going to smoke on saturdays so uh his, his recommendation for people who want to make a change to a healthier diet was to go whole whole board and or cold turkey to use an ironic expression uh, to, to basically completely stop eating uh, animal protein foods. Uh, and his claim was that your diet, your taste, not your taste buds would change, but your diet preferences would change, uh, your reaction to different foods would change, and it'd become far easier for you to adhere to this diet if you go all in rather than trying to estimate roughly what percent of your diet is coming from different kinds of foods to just go all in. So I decided a little over a month ago to test his theory that our taste preferences change and to go 28 days straight with no milk, dairy, eggs, um, milk and dairy, no dairy, eggs, meats, fish, which is uh, the uh, China study solution diet, which is what my mom is on and see if it changes my taste buds and uh, preferences. And I've now been, I finished the 28 days on Saturday. Uh, and then yesterday I found myself, well, now that I'm free and part of my experiment is now going to, I'm going to go have a teppanyaki steak. I'm going to go out for sushi. I'm going to go out for yakitori. I'm going to try all these things. I'm going to have a bowl of ice cream. Let's see if it still try tastes all good. These things and test his theory about whether our taste preferences change. My hypothesis is they do not. My hypothesis is I will still love a good teppanyaki. I'll still love a plate full of yakitori, a good bowl of ice cream, 
But what I have realized is it's not that hard for me to adhere to a stricter uh, healthy uh, vegetarian diet. Right. And, that, and, and I noticed yesterday, now that I'm through with my 28 days, that as I passed McDonald's, I was noticing them for the first time. I was saying, mm, I want, I, I, I'll, bet a, I'll bet a Big Mac and fries and a Coke would taste pretty good. Um, but, but it wasn't hard to resist. And so I, without, without being in my 28 day mode, I'm now 29 days. I'll probably go quite a few and will be, I'll, I expect that I'll eat sushi or yakitori special. I don't imagine I'll be going out for teppanyaki steaks much anymore. All right. Uh, so, and I ha, and I have gone from and a, your, an X, your health X, metrics have XXL improved. to an X, I thought I knew I would put an XL at Aloha shirt. So yep. I bought an XL and an L from Rain Spinners to see, and I found that the L is actually bigger than I wanted. I have lost 44 pounds in the last year. Oh my goodness. Uh, wow. Primarily, primarily just from shifting what I've been eating. Uh, and there are, there are all kinds of effective ways to lose weight. Some healthy, some not so healthy. The keto mm -hmm. diet is effective, but extremely unhealthy. Um, smoking is a good way to lose weight, not a terribly healthy way. Being a heroin addict is a great way to lose weight. Not a yeah, there's not a lot of overweight heroin addicts, and not and not sustainable, and not yeah, not sustainable. So, right. um, and one, Alan, one I, I, had, I fear this was going to happen. We, we're yeah, running out. I, of I time. talked too much. I always talk too much. That's okay. It was very interesting. Uh, maybe we'll have to do a second show to talk about your just strictly your investment strategy. But I want yep. to close. We do have some questions from viewers. Okay. Uh, we have two. We only have, I guess, time for one. But uh, the second one here, how has the pandemic impacted mm. uh, the investments that you have made or the industry overall since your yeah. experiment has been occurring right in the middle of the, the pandemic over the last sure. couple of years? Sure. Well, the, the biggest thing that happened is when the pandemic hit, I was very skeptical of the claims that were being made by the media uh, based on on my own experience uh, with uh, respiratory infectious diseases over the years, that it was as serious as was claimed. So when the stock market crashed in April of 2020, I dove in and I, I was seeing carnage across all sectors, especially within the travel and entertainment industry, of course, but uh, stock prices were down so low, uh, lower than I had. The drops in spring of 2020 were something I have not seen in 20 years of investing in the public stock markets as well as private. So the big uh, investments that I made was basically finding all the companies that had dropped more than 80% in three months and figuring they only have to come back halfway. And when we're through with this, you know, the, the business, if the business is sound and can survive the pandemic without going bankrupt, this is a good investment. So it was the easiest investment strategy I've ever deployed. And I've made, you know, a lot of people who did it have made, you know, five, six, seven times their money in a year. Wow. And a half. So, so the pandemic as a triggering event for a, an artificial crash, frankly, of the stock markets and buying, buying on the bottom was, was you know, the smartest thing I did. It has not changed. The pandemic itself hasn't changed my investment strategy in private equity and in angel investments. Pro pro largely because I've always assumed that an investment in a startup is a seven to 10 year process to exit. And it is, it is foolish in my mind to ever make a bet as an angel investor or venture capitalist on what's happening in the market today, what's happening in the world today. You really need to be looking at what, can that on what value can that entrepreneur build over the next 10 years? Is that market going to, is the opportunity that he's pursuing one that's likely to continue growing for the next 10 years? So that the time frame is very mm -hmm. different. What has changed uh, somewhat perhaps because of the pandemic and it has raised my awareness of what's going on in the traditional medical pharmaceutical establishment and how abusive that industry can be sometimes as compared to the lifestyle. So I have shifted my angel investment focus and this is what you wanted to talk about. Maybe we'll do another session sometime mm -hmm. from investing in IT startups to investing in uh, farms in vegan fast food chains in uh, I'm looking to build a convenience store a Japanese style convenience store which has delicious fresh food that are all uh, adhering to this whole plant food uh, diet paradigm the healthy food paradigm I'm looking to I'm trying to find medical doctors who are interested in learning the state of the art of lifestyle medicine in the United States and bringing the practice medical practice of lifestyle medicine to Japan and hopefully getting a number of clinics going here, sponsoring some research. So all of my 
the vast majority, I should say, of my uh, venture capital and angel investments in, over the last year have been in trying to make connections in the space, trying to move the needle uh, in the space toward preserving the very healthy traditional Japanese diet, <clears throat> making access to fresh fruits and vegetables uh, easier, supporting farmer, small farmers that are wanting to, to explore organics, um, and then looking at things, opportunities on the retail end of things and in the medical practice end of things, what can I do with doctors? What can I do with research? What can I do with how people get uh, convenient foods at a moderate price uh, that are healthier than what's in the convenience stores here or the fast food industry today? So moving, moving, moving the needle on the least healthy parts of the food ecosystem in Japan to be healthier. Um, and so uh, wow. but the biggest the biggest thing was was seeing was seeing a market crash unlike anything I could I'd ever seen before that was easily explainable and easily recoverable and diving all in at mm -hmm. the bottom in uh, March and April. All right, March. Alan. Well, yeah, unfortunately, we're up against it here. I, we do need a second show so you can go into more detail about the investments that you've made over the last year and okay. um, how that is uh, bearing fruit. No pun intended there. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a fascinating topic. Thank you so much for uh, taking time to sure. talk about this transition. And I guess we should thank your mom for her uh, early advocacy with you on this topic. And uh, now you've come to a point where you're actively attempting to change Japan, not on the focus of technology where you historically have been doing and have, have yeah. had a profound effect, but also now in this lifestyle area, it's fascinating. Also, thank you, Alan, for being a benefactor uh, oh. To think Tech Hawaii, you made a donation uh, to support this program, and uh, we all appreciate that very much. So for my viewers, again, happy holidays, wonderful, happy new year to you all. Uh, I'll be back again in, uh, I think it's on January 10th, my next show will be, we'll do a uh, review of 2021 with the my posse of professors from Kansai Gaidai that look at political happenings and the relationship between Japan and the United States. That'll be next month. Thanks so much, Alan. Really appreciate it. And My pleasure. Bye-bye, um, everyone. Fun. Steve.